welcome to the Acres of Diamonds podcast with Bob Larson, a nationally recognized expert in the analysis of complex life insurance structures. In the Acres of Diamonds podcast, Bob talks about the flip side of owning a life insurance policy that your client has outgrown or that has underperformed. We share insight and strategies to help advisors maximize the effectiveness and value of their clients' life insurance policies. Hello and welcome to the Acres of Diamonds podcast with Bob Larson from Settlement Masters. Today, Bob is going to be taking us through some of the myths. We're going to, he's going to demyth some of the questions and, and concerns about the settlement industry. I'm really excited to get into this one. Bob gave us a view on the last podcast of why it's so important, but now we're kind of going to get into the nitty gritty of what people are thinking and and I'm excited to hear it. So, so Bob, how are you today? I am fantastic. It's Tuesday and I am ready to go. Fantastic. So, Bob, when I think of settlement, I have these really cheesy commercials in my mind. People that are like, I won the lottery and, and now I take payments, and but I want my money right now. So who do I call? And then there's some sort of settlement that they can get. But I know that they, I, I just don't think it's all real. I don't think it's, you know, I have some concerns about that, that part of the industry. But I don't think that's what this is. So, Bob, what is a life settlement? Well, as Eric, it's a great question. And I'm sure that many listeners have had that same thought run through their mind in the past, it is something that sometimes we overlook because we don't real we don't realize what you know what's going through people's minds. That type of transaction is very different than a life settlement. A life settlement is sell, just at the simplest terms, it is one selling one's life policy to an institutional trust because it's worth a lot more doing it that way than cashing it in. And if they don't want the policy selling it to a buyer for compensation that's an institutional trust versus giving it back to the insurance company for the cash value makes a whole lot of sense. And that's why people do it. Yeah. I can't imagine that the insurance company is going to want to give them a a whole lot of anything on that life insurance policy compared to a, a different buyer, like you're saying. No, that's true. The insurance company will only give what's called the cash value, which is just a minimal part in most cases of what somebody has paid into that policy, it's the reserve of the insurance company, and that's what they'll give back. If there's anything there, give back to the owner of the life insurance policy. But again, a life settlement is taking it beyond that and allowing the institutional marketplace to arrive at a a value that is an investment value that is given to the owner of the life insurance contract. And it's typically, if it's a qualified conditioned policy, it's typically maybe three to 10 times on the upside of what the carrier would give back. So it's a sale between the owner, the, usually the insured, mm-hmm. the owner, or it could be a trust, and an institutional buyer that buys the life insurance contract as an investment. Got it. Bob, you've been doing this for a very long time. When people hear about selling their life, in, uh, their life policy, what do they normally worry about? That's a great question because when I first heard about, heard about it years ago, I thought, wow, this is not not really good. They worry about, in their mind, thinking about selling a policy to someone, individual, mm. when somebody thinks about a buyer of a life insurance policy. And that doesn't sit well with most people. Yeah, they don't I, I want an that. individual <laughs> to own no. the policy. Yeah, no, I, I can't imagine that at all. That would be a little nerve wracking, I think. But so how long has this been going on? I mean, as far as the, the settlement industry, how, how long has this been, been in existence? Hey, Eric, that's a great question because people like things that have been seasoned and, mm-hmm. and have been in the world for a long time. The only reason that this becomes a viable thing for people that are in this category over 70 is that it, life insurance has been deemed as real property. And the courts in a court case back in 1915, that's 1915, Mm. 1915, deemed that life insurance was real property. And when that happened, it was the beginning of real change for the life insurance industry relative to it being real property. And from that point on, over the years, It has revolved, or I'm sorry, evolved to the regulated industry that it is, 
that's a phenomenal benefit for the right category of people. 103 years ago, that's <laughs> that, that's just, just a little bit ago, 103 years ago, when that happened, how did that change the view of life insurance in general? Well, it did big time because even today, people think of insurance in one box. They think of life insurance as a protection during a certain period like auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, fire insurance. Mm-hmm. They pay the insurance company if they have a loss, they're protected annually. And that's how they think about insurance. They put it in the same box. Life insurance, because it's deemed as real property, is in a totally separate category because in, a, in the original state, when it was deemed real, real property, it was a property that had a, a specified period and a specified pricing to carry that contract age 95. Even though maybe the pricing might change based on criteria, it is real property. You own it. You have the right to keep it regardless. So you own it for a period, unlike that of auto insurance, fire insurance, and other types of insurance where they actually can cancel you uh, at any time. This is real property. You own it when you buy it outside of term insurance. And term insurance is is good for a settlement if converted up to a certain age, and it became viable for a settlement. But the difference is you own it you have a you have a, a period as long as you pay the required premium, they cannot cancel the policy. So that's what constitutes it being a a varied a real uh, property issue. To, you know, today there's Eric. There's different forms of life insurance. Many of them are used for retirement accumulation. Mm-hmm. That's unique. It's real property, and sometimes it's just protecting family and businesses from a loss. So that's what makes it different when the view of life insurance became a real property in 1915. It's real property, but some of it has an expiration date, if I'm not mistaken. So how does that play into it? Well, that's true. Life insurance, once you buy it and you purchase permanent insurance, uh, you own it. The life insurance, in many cases, if you cash it in, will give you back Uh, some amount of money, if there is any left in the reserve, Mm -hmm. if you don't want it. Uh, Most of all, the money that you paid into it sometimes can come back, but very rarely. It it makes a real property, as I said, you own it and you control it. If you buy it on a permanent basis, you own it. They can't cancel it. That policy, as long as you pay the amount that's Mm. required, it's your property, and that's what the court case made in 1915. That's why it is even saleable to an institutional market. You're transferring that ownership to an institutional trust. Okay, then where does life settlement fit in with with all that you just covered? Well, the, the key is, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but a life insurance settlement is where a qualified buyer, which is called a provider a manager of funds, a qualified buyer, looks at the policy and determines the present value uh, of that contract on a life ins- on a life basis. A settlement company can give you much, much more than the insurance company would if you were just to drop it or if you didn't want the policy. Uh, you know that the reason that it gives more is because the life settlement company evaluates the life expectancy of the individual in a group, and that individual uh, will be given a life expectancy number. Let me explain life expectancy because I think that's an important issue also. Life expectancy means that 50% of the people at the time the policy is purchased by the institutional trust, 50% of those people will have passed away, but 50% will still be alive. So as an investor, they have to determine how much they are going to have to pay to keep the policy alive, keep it current, while the probability is that 50% of the people will have died. But in most cases, it's three to four times what the policy, the the client has in policy cash value that the insurance company would give them. Got it. I want to go back to some of the concerns. So, you know, things we spoke about a little bit ago, you'd mentioned that, you know, people are concerned about who's actually going to be buying the policy. When people have those concerns, what do you tell them and and how do you help them overcome that? Well, Eric, uh, it is a common concern, whether expressed or not. So we express it up front. 
And that is people will think of selling life insurance, selling to an individual. They want to know who's going to own my policy. So we cover it right up front and we, we give them an understanding that there's a difference in who buys that contract. Years ago, there were small investor groups that bought life insurance contracts and pay cash for it. They may have been three individual wealthy investors, and they bought the contracts and held them. They knew who the policy owners were, the insureds were, where they lived, knew their medical condition. People don't like that. Yeah. That's well, that's pretty much phased out. But even so... We make sure that the documents that people get when they are interested in selling, the policy is qualified for selling, and we've gone in the bidding market and had multiple funds bid on it, that the final closing documents, just like in a real estate escrow, state that the buyer is an institutional buyer and no individual will ever own that policy outright. So we eliminate those concerns because, frankly, if my mother was selling her policy uh, believe me, I would have that same concern, and I want to make sure that I'm protected in that in that respect. So people can't buy individually this policy that they would be, uh, through our firm anyway, so there's more incentive in that person dying than living. We don't want, we want to eliminate that issue. That's a big concern. I, I can imagine. Bob, I am known as, I guess I'm in the sandwich generation, from what I've heard it called, uh, where I have kids, and I also have parents that are still living and my parents and I have talked about life insurance, and I know what they have for the retirement and, and the, the income they're on, so on and so forth. If, if I see that this is a value and this is something that I'm, I'm maybe I'm listening to this podcast, and I think this is a good conversation to have with my parents, or more importantly, a conversation I should have with you, uh, how does that work? I mean, if I'm, if I'm not the one necessarily with the policy, can I have that conversation with you, Bob? Absolutely. In fact, that's where we usually get involved when a either advisor refers us to a client to that's concerned. If you're under 60 and you have parents that are living, the probability is that one of them will have life insurance. And as a result of looking at what the parents want, they've done planning because they want you as the child mm -hmm. and your children's mm -hmm. children, your, their grandchildren to receive what they built up in life after they've gone. The question is, is what they've done to pass that down, is it working? Now, I, I say that because most of the family members are unaware of what the parents have done, number one. They're, number two, they're mostly highly concerned about asking the question because it will sound like they're interested in their inheritance. Mm -hmm. And most children are just not willing to bring the subject up. But here's the here's the the pathway, if if I, if I will, about bringing this up. Mom and dad may have done a lot of planning. You may be under sixty and have a mom and dad in the eighty or ninety age category, which are prime settlement age groups. Uh, you may say that you may have recently been introduced to the fact that life insurance has changed for many people to where it is no longer affordable because of the increased premium that carriers have imposed upon individuals. Mm -hmm. And that you have a firm that will evaluate the strength and the condition of their policies, and most people want that to be done. So we can take an objective diagnostic position to evaluate if the life insurance they purchased many years ago for the purpose of keeping the wealth in the family or passing wealth down to the kids is still substantially healthy and it is still working and working meaning staying in force based on the investment that they're making in it. Parents, unfortunately, typically look at life insurance once and then they put it in a drawer and forget about it. Mm -hmm. And that problem, Eric, is a big problem because of the $143 billion that's being dropped or cashed in every year, which is, by the way, an acceleration of probably 40% of what it's ever been in the past, there's a phenomenal number of those policies that are worth a lot more in the settlement marketplace. So children and family members need to help out because parents, on two levels, they're going to be responsible for the parents if they have minimal money for retirement when they get old and sick and they need long-term care. Absolutely. Usually, even my daughter was asking the other day about my long-term care and how I'd be positioned 
because their mother is getting aged and she's not well, and they're looking at having to take care of her. Many of you that are listening to this may have that concern. Well, life insurance can be converted into long-term care, but converting it in a way where the value of the policy that they no longer that they have, they no longer need or can afford once they have it reviewed can be converted into long-term care or more retirement funds so that they have less problems. Mm -hmm. You'll be doing your parents and your grandparents, if need be, a real favor by telling them about this problem and having this logically looked at from a number standpoint. All we do is give people the economics of keeping their life insurance and showing them what the reality is versus a capital value uh, analysis in the institutional market. And if the policy is not wanted to be kept and the children have helped their parents preserve an asset, in many cases would go away. Mm -hmm. And then the parents find out about it, Eric, long after it's, it's capable of being revived. And I'll give you just a quick example of that. We have a client that's been paying a certain amount of money forever thinking that that amount was the amount that they'd have to continue to pay. But policies issued in the late 80s and 90s and early 2000s had a lower premium going in, but it was based on the carrier earning a fixed amount of interest to credit to each of the policies. Mm -hmm. Well, earnings plummeted. Eric, yep. bonds, as you know, have gone down to basement level returns. And so that's what the insurance company primarily invests in. So now they have raised the cost of insurance because their earnings have not been sufficient. So the policy owner, instead of looking that they, they would normally pay 20000 a year, that was enough to keep their million dollar policy alive. Now they find out under one of our reviews that it's going to cost them 80000 a year to keep the policy alive until they pass away. And that's unaffordable. Well, why not convert that policy that may have a cash value of $20,000 into a value of three to $400,000 in the institutional marketplace? That's what children can talk about to their parents and grandparents. Absolutely. I mean, that's so important. And like you said, the evaluation is free, correct? Yeah, we do this as a free is a funny word. It's a complimentary evaluation. We are like, in some respects, a real estate agent that is bro brokering a house for a client that wants to sell it. Mm -hmm. And they get paid if they do a good job. Ours is a success fee, which is back-ended based on the value that we create over and above the cash value. So it is a vastly affordable process. We do a lot of work to make sure that we know if it's if they can keep the policy, what do they have to do? If they don't want to keep it, what are the prices in the institutional market? And, and we take care of all those expenses. And then if it's right for them, they choose it's right from an economic standpoint, then they move ahead in escrow, and just like a real estate transaction, and proceed in the process of selling the policy to an institutional buyer. Fantastic. Bob, we're, we're getting short on time here. What do you want to tell our listeners in summing this, this day up? Well, I would just say that because most people don't know the value of their life insurance, people don't know the condition of their life insurance, people that are uh, wanting that insurance contract are not wanting it. Some of them are letting it ride, meaning they're not paying any more into it. They feel like the cash value can cover the contract and it's not going to be enough. And so it's going to it's going to kind of like bankrupt once it runs out of value. I would say be vigilant. This is a real asset. And if you want to keep it, you should know what kind of investment you need to make in it. You need to find a qualified licensed broker that is willing to take the project on without charging you, but first showing you all the ways that you can keep the policy and maybe reduce the premium and keep it versus the capital value in the settlement market. They need to show you both. It's a real financial decision at this point. It's if you can make more by keeping it, then you should keep it. And, and you don't want to talk to somebody that doesn't share that with you because 99% of the brokers out there are only interested in selling the policy 
That's how they get paid. We've been in the business a long time, in the, 50, in the life insurance business over 50 years. And so we want to do best, serve, best practices and make sure that the client knows what they can do to keep it versus the economic, uh, economics of selling it to an institutional market. And that's a decision. It's black and white. Bob, I, I, speaking about the sandwich generation, my, my generation, if we have questions, I know we can call, but do you have documents and things on the website as well that, that they can, uh, the audience can download? Yes, we, we, we are constantly updating our website. It's, uh, you, it's the settlement, the T-H-E settlementmasters.com. That's T-H-E S-E-T-T-L-E-M-E-N-T M-A-S-T-E-R-S dot com, the settlementmasters dot com, or you can call me or any one of my team will direct you to get the information and or me at 877-927-7243. That's 877-927-7243. This is a, a big decision and you need to have objective input that shows you both keeping it versus selling it. We do webcasts with clients, teaching them what this is about. We give them information. If you choose someone, make sure they're doing all those things Mm -hmm. and everything is transparent and it's all told you up front. Bob, we've talked about this before. I know there is a sense of urgency when it comes to this because of the clock that is ticking. I encourage every person listening to this, check it out, go to the website, make the call, have a conversation. And Bob, you end every podcast with a wonderful quote that, that kind of hammers in that urgency. Can you give it to us one more time? Yeah, yeah, because there's so much stuff going on, people lapsing or dropping contracts, mm-hmm. 143 billion every year. The sense of urgency is get objective information and do it now. Your policy may be six months away from bankrupting itself. And so what I tell people, and I always quote this poem because it means so much to me, and that's on the plains of hesitation, bleak the bones of countless millions that on the dawn of victory sat down to think about it and wait, and there their policy died. And don't let that happen. It's a real piece of property. It's a real life investment. Get someone that gives you objective advice, and we at Settlement Masters will be here to help you if you choose us. Thank you for listening. Eric, thanks for the questions. Appreciate it. You bet. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And I I like the twist on the end of that one. So (laughs) thank you for all your time today. And thank you, audience, for listening to today's podcast with the Settlement Masters, Bob Larson. This is the Acre of Diamond podcast. If you have not subscribed to this podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Bob comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And we talked a lot about family today. If you have a, a parent that Maybe they need to hear this or they need to hear something else that Bob is saying in one of the other podcasts. If that helps make the conversation easier, we would love that. Again, thank you for listening today. For everyone at Acres of Diamond Podcast and the Settlement Masters, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Acres of Diamonds podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.